for 60 minutes flying around and having some fun. Let's go. We got to beat them now. Let's go. I'll tell you what. It can't be a one-time thing. It's got to be every time. In 1992, Pittsburgh area native Bill Cower returned to his hometown and watched his city come alive with a renewed sense of pride in its football team. A new generation became part of the team's best regular season in more than a season built on high intensity and high energy football. Hey, listen, don't let anything lay in the locker room. Just go out there, let's have some fun. Playing football, our style. We control the tempo of this football game today. Now let's go. A snap to O'Donnell. O'Donnell pranks, throws. Downfield, the ball is caught brilliantly by Ernie Mills. He's into the end zone for a touchdown. And he got the big six. We gotta, put this, we gotta get a killer instinct. Right. Put teams down, get the hell, get this game in our pocket. Oh, okay. Let's go. And a deep handoff. Going to Foster. Comes over the left side of 15 to 10 to 5. But got very good. Breaking over the left side. Galloping angly down to the left. Just a minute. Booting everybody in the secondary. Foster chucked loose and ran like a demon. We got to rush the quarterback relentlessly. Relentlessly. Let's get after the stop. Let's go. The rejuvenated Steelers captured their first AFC Central Division title since 1984. But for this team and its fans, 1992 was just the first step toward even bigger things. The first sign of a new beginning. A rainforest, the ultimate. The Bill Cower era began with the toughest of tests. An opening day trip to the Astrodome against the division rival Oilers, a team most experts had picked to run away with the AFC Central race. Early on, those experts appeared to be right. But what no one had counted on was the surprising resolve of these young Steelers and some surprising play calls from their young coach. And Mark Royals standing at his own 40 for the rush and is passing downfield. Completes the pass, pulled in by Warren Williams, galloping the 20, the 15, the 5. Whoa-wee! That was Royals throwing the pass. Williams was wide open over the middle, and Williams takes it to the Houston 1. That was absolutely a great call. The aggressive... And turn the afternoon into a nightmare for Houston quarterback Warren Moon. The Steelers forced Moon into five interceptions, two each by number 26 and safety Larry Griffin, who second of the day clinched the comeback victory. Moon takes the snap, rolls a little to the right, throws, picks off down inside the five, and here we go again. The field, Larry Griffin over the 30, hit and knocked down at the 33 yard line and mobbed by his teammates. Going down to Houston and being the underdog as we were, to come out with a victory uh, in a place where not many people gave us a chance, I certainly think gave us some confidence. And as we talked about the expectation of winning, it certainly gave credence to that and kind of maybe been, was the building block uh, uh, for us to get something started. O'Donnell giving that ball to Foster. Big hole through the middle of 20 to 50. He's headed in. Down five. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. The following week, it was Barry Foster who kept the Steelers rolling with 190 yards rushing and two scores. Running, running, coming down the sideline, the 40 to 35 to 30. Running for dear life, the 20 to 15 to 10 to 5. Hit into the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. One week later in Sundrench, San Diego, it was quarterback Neil O'Donnell who shone the brightest. 
O'Donnell ran for one score and threw for two more as Pittsburgh dominated the eventual AFC West champion. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Oh, you betcha. 79, and had become the biggest early season surprise in the NFL. No Steeler made quicker strides from obscurity to stardom than third-year running back Barry Foster, the new workhorse in Pittsburgh's power running. It's a new offense that featured big linemen, like 290-pound tackle John Jackson, meeting defenders head-on and powering open a rushing lane. In the new system, Foster became the Steelers' most valuable player carrying the ball 390 times for 1,690 yards, both Steelers' records. And behind the blocks of fullback Merrill Hodge and guard Duval Love, Foster became a Pro Bowl starter as the AFC's leading rusher. Center Dermonte Dawson joined Foster in the Pro Bowl, anchoring a line that successfully blended the experience of Tunjilkin with the youth of Justin Strelzik and Pro Bowl guard Carlton Hasselrig. Power blocking and power running became the foundation of the Steelers' offense, and when it was working, it made scoring look easy. Go on. You okay? You want to score a touchdown? Yeah. Well, then go. First down, 10. Hand off to Foster. To the middle. He's open. He's in the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. And they could have driven a truck through that hole. It's a system that puts a premium on running the football, which is an offensive line we love to do. Uh, when the offense is clicking, it opens everything up, the passing game, the running game. And when you can play offense like that, you can dictate uh, the flow of a game. And I think that's why we've had the success that we've had. The Steelers' offense developed a resiliency that allowed it to bounce back from tough situations and regain control. Its short-range passing game remained effective, even in the most difficult conditions, as Neil O'Donnell set a team record for completion percentage on the way to his first Pro Bowl. O'Donnell spread the ball to a variety of emerging young targets. At midseason, the Steelers had an opportunity to showcase their offense two straight weeks in the primetime spotlight. The first came on a Monday night in week seven when Pittsburgh broke a two-game losing streak by dominating the bank. Donald has time, going downfield, the score, touchdown Pittsburgh, they threaded the needle. Dwight Stone caught two touchdown passes in the shutout victory, and one week later, before a Sunday night national TV audience, the Steelers would truly find out how far they'd come against the heavily favored Chiefs and the Tomahawk Chop. 7-19 to play in the first quarter. Barker's kick. Wobbly. Not too good. And up comes Woodson. Bobbles it at the 22. Gets it back up at the 25 to 30. Here he comes. Up over the 50. To the 30. Down to the 20. He's going. 10, 5. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Woodson came right through Kansas City like water through a spill. Rod Woodson opened the floodgates and the Steelers poured through all night. Foster barrels over the right side into the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. What a move by Foster. What a job by the line up ahead of him. Again, Foster's the lone setback and a fake by O'Donnell. Fires the pass into the end zone for the touchdown. The Steelers have proven they could play with anybody. And while they had caught fire in Kansas City, 
their season would reach the boiling point the following week in a showdown with the Oilers. One of them days, brother. You one of them days. Got a game you want to play in here. With both teams at five and two, this was a battle for control of the division. And for a while, it appeared those experts who, like Houston, were right all along. But the Steelers had come back against these Oilers once before, and they certainly weren't about to let go of first place that easily. Number 78, Gary Howe, helped lead the defensive charge and fuel the emotions of the most vocal Pittsburgh crowd in more than a decade. I tell you, this football crowd, is, it, it is playing as big a factor in this game as the Steelers' defense right now. Out of the slot, Mills over to the right, faked by O'Donnell, and he fires it to Cooper in the end zone for the touchdown. While the Steelers' defense shut the Oilers down, Neil O'Donnell and the offense just kept coming. Eric Green's first down conversion on third and 16 was the key play in Pittsburgh's drive toward the go-ahead score. Let's go, that's it! That's the way to move it! Oh, get that big six! And O'Donnell with a play fake to the left. This direction fires into the end zone. And the touchdown as he hits Green down at the end line. Beautiful fake by O'Donnell. The Steelers held on. And for the rest of the season, the AFC Central would belong to Pittsburgh. One play at a time. Communicate. Make sure you and Darren are on the same page. Fly around and hit some people. Have some fun. Play with some high intensity. By midseason, the enthusiasm of the Steelers' young first-year coach had become as big a hit with the fans as it had with the players. Let's go now. We got to cover. We got to cover. Read the end. Come hard backside, Charles. You can make the play. Cowher's intensity was transferred to special teamers like Warren Williams and Jerry Olsavsky. Charles Davenport and number 99, LeVon Kirkland, also showed the same passion that their coach had once displayed during his special teams career. The best coverage team in the National Football League. He wants to go out there and play. I mean, he's a young guy, he's a big guy, aggressive, and he just sometimes seems like he just wants to run out in that field and make a tackle and hit someone. That's, that's the type of personality he does have. Hey! Then, if you want to get a two-point stance, you get where you feel like you can rush the quarterback. You understand? Yeah. Rush the quarterback. It's going now. Relentless, Greg. Got to keep going. You got to be relentless. Just got to keep going, Jay. You got to keep going. Got to keep rushing. Got to keep rushing. <laughs> Linebacker Greg Lloyd was nothing but relentless. Lloyd led the team in forced fumbles, recoveries, and sacks, and seemed to possess a built-in radar that allowed him to seek and destroy whoever had the ball. Lloyd made his second trip to the Pro Bowl, and in 1992 was complimented by another lightning-quick Gerald Williams. In his first full year as a starter, Williams became a defensive spark plug, and other young defenders were called on to play with the same fire. I want you to challenge her when we're involved in man to man. You understand me? I don't care if you get beat. Challenge her. The Steelers' secondary constantly challenged opponents as safety Carnell Lake made a big impact with an all-pro caliber season. And Pro Bowl cornerback Rod Woodson added another dimension to his game with a career-high six sacks. Woodson also maintained his status as one of the premier coverage cornerbacks in the NFL. 
and his play overshadowed the consistency of fellow cornerback D.J. Johnson. Richard Shelton and Sammy Walker were other big contributors, but the most pleasant surprise was free safety Darren Perry, number 39, the Steelers' Rookie of the Year with a team high six interceptions. Overall, Pittsburgh's intensity created a bounty of opportunity as the Steelers led the NFL with 43 takeaways. The Steelers constructed major roadblocks on their opponent's road to the end zone, as no team in football allowed fewer touchdowns than Pittsburgh. O'Brien is back again. Uh-oh, his pass picked off. This is Larry Griffin coming down the field with the ball. He's to the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. The Steelers' opportunistic defense helped turn the tide in several ball games, including a Week 10 contest with the Lions. Kramer takes the snap. He is hit. He fumbles the football. It's loose. It's scooped up. It's loose again. And down the field they go. And running with the football, Parnell Lake. Yoy and double Yoy. What another big play by Rod Woodson. It's manna from heaven. High formation. Brister. Lobs him into the end zone for the touchdown. The ball taken by Tim Jordan. Nobody covering him out to the left. The victory was the start of a four-game winning streak that saw different heroes emerge each week. Against the Colts, Gary Anderson hit on three of three field goals, and Barry Foster rushed for 168 yards to post his club record eighth 100-yard rushing game of the season. Number 34, Leroy Thompson helped the Steelers roll up more than 250 yards on the ground. And the following week, it was Bengals quarterback David Klingler who was constantly on the run. Donald Evans, Kenny Davidson, Aaron Jones, and nose tackle Gerald Williams were part of a relentless front that waves and tallied a team record 10 sacks. Number 50, David Little, had three sacks alone. And the team's leading tackler, Hardy Nickerson, added another. The Steelers' record-setting show of defensive muscle was complemented by some heads-up special teams. And here's the best snap, and I'm not sure what happened, but the Steelers have the football, and firing down the field, there's a touchdown, Pittsburgh. Charles Davenport fielded it on a dead The fourth straight victim was Seattle. As the Steelers' defense once again shut an opponent down to help the offense overcome a four... To give to Foster, running to the left. The end zone touchdown. It was week in, week out team consistency that had kept the Steelers atop the AFC Central. And in the regular season finale, they rallied behind backup quarterback Bubby Brister for yet another crucial victory. In his third straight start in place of the injured Neil O'Donnell, Brister completed 18 of 25 passes. But another Steeler was looking to add to an even more impressive set of numbers. Over the course of the season, Barry Foster had posted an amazing 11 100-yard rushing games, one short of tying an NFL record. And so on this final regular season Sunday, Foster chased history, and late in the fourth quarter, he ran it down. And he gives to Foster, now he gets a block, comes to the outside, and he's running a field across the 25. And that's going to take him over 100 yards. He has 12 100-yard rushing games this season. That ties the all-time NFL record set in 1984 by Eric Dickerson. The Steelers' 11-5 record was their best since 1979. And with home field advantage throughout the playoffs, 
Pittsburgh seem primed for the postseason. Winner of this year's Academy Award for Best Picture. I got nobody but you, Frankie. Academy Award winners Clint Eastwood, Hilary Swank, and Morgan Freeman. The city was alive for Pittsburgh's first home playoff game since 1982, and the Steelers were determined to make it worth a wait. Barry Foster rushed for 104 yards, but overall, the Steelers failed to play up to the potential they had shown all season. Too much to overcome. And O'Donnell's hit fumbles the football. And the Bills say we have it. It is Buffalo's ball. That's unbelievable. The Steelers simply let too many opportunities slip through their grasp. And right throwing to the far side. Almost picked off by Shelton. Oh, Ooh, boy. Shelton almost had it. The playoff loss was a painful reminder of how difficult it is to maintain a consistent level of excellence. And it is a lesson the Steelers can build on in the upcoming season. We all have to have a sense of where we want to go. And once we've accomplished that, I think we need to set higher goals. That's what allows you to get better and never become status quo. Because I've always believed that no one ever stays the same. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. And so I think uh, the only way you can maintain that drive is to have goals. Bill Cowher's goals are no different than that of his predecessor, Chuck Knoll. same electricity has been reborn in a new generation. You know, it feels great to play games at home because it's like the old days from what I hear in the 70s when they were dominating back then. And the city of Pittsburgh is on fire. These people are really pumped up for the season. And we're a very young football team. I believe we're going to get better in time. You want emotion? Watch his football team play football for 60 minutes. Okay. We'll show you emotion. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you're the best in the National Football League. That's the way you got to think. In 1992, the Steelers did take a big step toward being the best in the NFL. But they must continue to move forward in 1993. They are young, explosive, and sparked by the NFL Coach of the Year. And they are striving for even bigger things just ahead. Yes, 1992 was just a start for the Steelers and their fans. One remarkable season that successfully signaled a new beginning.